Welcome to the next lecture on the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Paul. This lecture is going to focus on Bitcoin transactions. We'll go through an overview of transactions. We'll talk about transaction inputs and transaction outputs. We'll dive into transaction scripts and the Bitcoin script language. We'll talk about digital signatures. And we'll talk about how uh, Bitcoin explorers and other applications abstract abstract details from the transaction data. So to begin with, uh, transactions are probably the most important part of the Bitcoin system. Everything else in Bitcoin is designed to ensure that the transactions can be created. And then those transactions can be transmitted across the network. Uh, Bitcoin nodes that receive the transactions can validate them. And then those miners will add the validated transactions into a block on the blockchain, which is our global ledger of transactions. So if you think about it, uh, a transaction is, the concept of it is essential to the concept of Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, you can think of transactions as being data structures that describe the transfer of value between participants in the Bitcoin system. Each transaction is essentially a public entry in Bitcoin's blockchain. And, and you know, this global double entry bookkeeping ledger of transactions. So in this lecture, we're gonna talk about different forms of transactions, what they contain, how to create transactions, how to verify transactions, and how transactions become part of the permanent record of all the transactions. Um, so when, I'm referring to the term wallet in this lecture. I'm referring to the client side UI software that constructs transactions, not just the, fact, the, uh, the wallet database of keys. So here's an example of a block explorer application and what it might show. And in this particular example is, a, the example I showed in a couple of previous lectures where Alice is buying a cup of coffee from Bob. Um, and this is an, a, a transaction from a number of years ago, 2013. Um, and at that time, um, Alice wanted to pay uh, approximately 0 0.015 BTC to buy a cup of coffee. Um, she had 0.1 BTC, so she also um, gave herself some change a 0 0.0845 BTC. So this Block Explorer application shows a transaction from Alice's address, the CDID address, to Bob's address, this one GDK 9 UZ. But much of this information that we're seeing here on the screen is not actually contained in the transaction itself. Instead, this information is computed or looked up at from, uh, from the minimal information that's contained in the actual transaction. So, um, so the structure of the transaction that machines can read is much different. Um, you know, it's gonna have a lot of different strange values that are hard to read um, and that are really meant for the software to process. So here's a look at what the transaction details look like if you were actually to look at them. Um, it starts with a version one, a lock time zero, a VIN, a, a transaction ID, a v version out, a script sig, a sequence. Uh, then it's got a, a V out, it's got a value, a script pub key, a value and a script pub key. So if we go back and we look a second ago, you know, obviously this is very different from what we're seeing here. Uh, some of those things might be related, but it is quite different. Um, you know, for example, we see script pub keys and script sigs and sequences. Um, and most of those are very different from what we see over here. Now, what we do see in there that's the same is we've got these two numbers here, 0 0.0015 BDC and 0 0.0845 BDC. And those are actually right here and here. So the two values of Bitcoin during the outputs are actually 
in the transaction. But notice that we've got an input of point 0.1 BTC, but over here it never mentions for our input that it's an input of point 0.1 BTC. So what's going on there? Well, one thing that's going on there is that uh, because this is an input, um, we can, you know, we've got this transaction ID referring to the previous transaction ID. Um, and this, by the way, the zero here is saying which output from that transaction ID. What it's, the, the computer is doing when it reads this, trans, this message here, this transaction, um, say, uh, say a blockchain node that wants to validate this as a transaction, it will take this transaction ID and this V out and it will go look up the value for that output. And so it will see that in the previous transaction, there was an output of 0.1. And so it basically knows, oh, that means there's an output of 0.1. Uh, and so that's how it figures it out. Now the script SIGs and the sequence and the script pub keys we'll get into in a minute. Uh, but basically that gives you the idea that um, what you're actually seeing in an Explorer view is you know, quite a bit different from what's being passed on the network as an actual transaction. So we're gonna dive into explaining all these things in this lecture. So we're gonna start with by talking about transaction outputs and inputs. Uh, you know, the fundamental building block of a Bitcoin transaction is a transaction output. Uh, transaction outputs are indivisible chunks of Bitcoin currency recorded on the blockchain and recognized as valid by the entire network. Bitcoin full nodes track all available and spendable outputs known as unspent transaction outputs or UTXOs. The collection of all UTXOs is known as the UTXO set and currently numbers in the millions of UTXOs. Uh, the UTXO set grows as new to UTXOs are created and shrinks when UTXOs are consumed. Every transaction represents a change or a state transition in the UTXO set. When we say that a user's wallet has received Bitcoin, what we mean is that the wallet has detected on the blockchain a UTXO that can be spent with one of the keys controlled by the wallet. Thus, a user's Bitcoin balance is the sum of all UTXO that that user's wallet can spend and which could be scattered among hundreds of transactions and hundreds of blocks. Uh, the concept of a balance is created by the wallet application. The wallet calculates the user's balance by scanning the blockchain and aggregating the value of any UTXOs a wallet can spend with the keys it controls. Most wallets maintain a database or use a database service to store a quick reference set of all the UTXOs they can spend with the keys they control. So here's an example of a transaction chain. Uh, between Alice and from Joe to Alice and Alice to Bob and Bob to Gopesh. So let's talk about how this works. Um, so over, you know, if we look here uh, at, the, at this list of blocks and let's look at the, uh, the very, the far left side, okay? Um, and so in block 277.298, Alice is receiving uh, some Bitcoin from, Bob, from Joe. So remember Alice you know, acquired some Bitcoin so that she could then use Bitcoin and try it out and buy, and buy coffee from Bob. So first she had to get that Bitcoin from Joe and that was a, tran a transfer of 0.1 Bitcoin from Joe to Alice in block 277.298. And Joe apparently got that Bitcoin in block 277.278. Um, and of course, you could look through the blockchain all the way back to the Genesis block in block number zero. Um, so in the UTXO set, basically, we are doing a transfer from Joe to Alice. Now, in this particular original transaction, Joe was not getting any change. So basically, we just, you know, kind of got, we got rid of Joe's unspent transaction output and created a new transaction output for Alice. And so Joe's a transaction output's now spent. Alice is, is unspent. All right, so a few blocks later in 277316, Alice is going to buy a cup of coffee from Bob. Now, this is transaction two. When she does that, she is going to spend her original transaction back in 277298 
uh, but she's going to create two outputs. The first output is the payment to Bob of like 0 0.015. And then the other output is the change coming back to Alice about 0 0.0845. So she spends one transaction output. And so original transaction is now uh, down the UTXO set. It's got dotted dash lines around it and it's white to represent it's been spent, which we've now created two new UTXOs. Uh, Bob's payment for the coffee and Alice's change. And so the UTXO set now has two UTXOs in it. Uh, then on block 277430, Bob is going to send some Bitcoin over to Gopesh. And Bob will also give himself some change. Um, so he, take, he took the payment from Alice and he sent it off to Gopesh and he's got some change coming. So in this case, then his uh, original transaction from 277316 is now spent. So we got it uh, the little dashed lines around it. And it's blank in the UTXO set. But we added two new UTXOs, one for Gopesh and one for Bob. And so the UTXO set got larger. Uh, so in this case, when we're spending one UTXO and creating two new ones, each time we're increasing the UTXO set size. So a transaction output can have an arbitrary integer value denominated, denominated as a multiple of Satoshis. Just as dollars can be divided down to two decimal places as cents, Bitcoin can be divided down to eight decimal places as Satoshis. Although an output can have any arbitrary value, once created, it's indivisible. This is an important characteristic of Bitcoin outputs that needs to be emphasized. Outputs are discrete, indivisible units of value denominated in an integer number of Satoshis. An unspent output can only be consumed in its entirety by a transaction. If a UTXO is larger than the desired value of a transaction, it should still be consumed in its entirety and change must be generated in the transaction. Uh, in other words, if you have a UTXO worth 20 Bitcoin and want to pay only one Bitcoin, your transaction must consume the entire 20 Bitcoin UTXO and produce two outputs, one paying one Bitcoin to your desired recipient and another paying 19 Bitcoin and change back to your wallet. As a result of the indivisible nature of transaction outputs, most Bitcoin transactions will have to generate change. You know, imagine uh, a shopper who's buying a dollar fifty beverage, reaching into her wallet and uh, trying to find a combination of coins and banknotes to cover the dollar fifty cost. The shopper would choose exact change if necessary. For example, that shopper has a dollar bill and two quarters, or a combination of smaller denominations like six quarters or if necessary, a larger unit, such as a $5 bill. If the shopper hands over too much money, say $5 to the shop owner, the shopper will expect $3.50 in change, which the shopper will then put in her wallet and have available for future transactions. Similarly, a Bitcoin transaction must be created from a user's UTXO and whatever denominations that user has available. Users can't cut a UTXO in half any more than they can cut a dollar bill in half and use it as currency. The user's wallet application will typically select from the user's available UTXO to compose an amount greater than or equal to the desired transaction amount. As with real life, the Bitcoin application that is in your wallet can use several strategies to satisfy the purchase amount, combining several smaller units, buying an exact change, or using a single unit larger than a transaction value and making change. All of this complex assembly of spendable UTXOs is done by the user's wallet automatically and the user never sees all this stuff. It's only relevant if you're creating your own program that's gonna construct raw transactions from UTXO using the Bitcoin Core APIs. A transaction consumes previously recorded unspent transaction outputs and creates new transaction outputs that can be consumed by a future transaction. This way, chunks of Bitcoin value move forward from owner to owner in a chain of transactions consuming and creating UTXOs. The exception of the output and input chain is a special type of transaction called the Coinbase transaction, which is the first transaction in each block. This is, this is a transaction that's placed there by the winning miner and creates brand new Bitcoin payable to that miner as a reward for mining. This special Coinbase transaction does not consume UTXOs. Instead, it has a special type of input call, called the Coinbase. This is how Bitcoin's money supply is created during the mining process as we'll talk about in our lecture on mining. 
So you might ask yourself first, what, what comes first, inputs or outputs, the chicken or the egg? Well, if you think about it, outputs come first because Coinbase transactions, which generate new Bitcoin, have no inputs and create outputs from nothing. Uh, so every Bitcoin transaction creates outputs, which are, which are recorded in the Bitcoin ledger. Almost all of these outputs uh, create spendable chunks of Bitcoin called UTXOs, which are then recognized by the whole network and available for the owner to spend in a future transaction. UTXOs are tracked by every full and load Bitcoin client in the UTXO set. Uh, new transactions consume one or more of these outputs from the UTXO set. So transaction outputs consist of two parts, an amount of Bitcoin denominated Satoshis, which is our smallest Bitcoin unit, and a cryptographic puzzle that determines the conditions required to spend the output. The cryptographic puzzle is also referred to as a locking script, a script pub key, or a witness script. The transaction scripting language, which is used in the locking script, uh, will be described in more detail when we talk about the script, Bitcoin script language. So let's take a look at an example uh, of the transaction details we looked at before. Um, so this is actually uh, encoded in JSON, and the outputs are an array list where well, the array list is called VOUT, V-O-U-T. Um, and you can see here, we've got a value, a script pub key, then we've got a value and a script pub key. So the transaction has two outputs. You know, again, one output is going to Bob from Ellis and the other output is changed going back to Ellis. Each output is described by a value and a script pub key. So the value is the amount and the script pub key is what someone has to do to spend that amount and send it somewhere else. Um, so right here, this value that we're looking at is actually in Bitcoins, 0.015 or 0.0845. But if we were looking at uh, the transaction as it's actually being sent, it would actually be an integer number, not a decimal, and it would be some number of Satoshis. Um, so we'll talk about how you lock and unlock these uh, Bitcoin to be spent through the cryptographic puzzles in a little bit later when we talk about Bitcoin script. But before we do that, let's describe the overall structure of transaction inputs and outputs. So when transactions are transmitted over the network or exchange between applications, they are serialized. Serialization is the process of converting the internal representation of a data structure into a format that can be transmitted over the network or into storage one byte at a time, also known as a byte stream. So serialization is most commonly used for encoding data structures for transmission over a network or for storage in a file. And the serialization format is shown in a table right here, uh, where we've got um, an amount, which is a Bitcoin value in Satoshi's, uh, a locking size script, a locking script size telling us the size of the locking script, then followed by what the conditions are to actually spend that output. Most Bitcoin libraries and frameworks do not store transactions internally as byte streams, as that would require complex parsing every time you needed to access a single field. Uh, for convenience and readability, Bitcoin libraries store transactions internally in data structures. The process of converting from the byte stream representation of a transaction to a library's internal representation data structure is called deserialization. You know, you serialize it to store it on disk and then deserialize it to bring it back into the main memory. So transaction inputs identify by reference which UTXOs are gonna be consumed and provide proof of ownership through an unlocking script. To build a transaction, a wallet selection the UTXOs it controls um, and finds the UTXOs with enough value to make the required payment. Sometimes one UTXO is enough, other times you might need more than one. For each UTXO is gonna be consumed to make the payment, 
the wallet creates one input point of the UTXO and unlocks it with an unlocking script. Let's look at the components of an input in greater detail. The first part of an input is a pointer to a UTXO by reference to the transaction hash and an output index, which identifies the specific UTXO in that transaction. The second part is an unlocking script, which the wallet constructs in order to satisfy the spending conditions set in the UTXO. Most often, the unlocking script is a digital signature and a public key proving ownership of the Bitcoin. However, not all unlocking scripts contain signatures. The third part is a sequence number, which we'll talk about later. So here we've got an example of an input. Uh, again, this is the input where Alice is sending her payment to Bob. Um, and we see down below, we've got the transaction ID. We've got the V out, which specifies which output associated with that transaction ID. And since it's zero, it's, it's referring to the first output. Then we have a script sig, which is how she's going to unlock it. And then a sequence number, which we'll talk about later. So as you can see, there's only one input in this list. Um, so we've got our transaction ID, our output index, our script sig, and our sequence number. So transactions on their own seem incomplete because they lack context. Um, you know, looking at the input, we, we don't really know too much about the UTXO other than a reference to the current transaction containing it. We don't know its value uh, amount in Satoshi. We don't know the locking script to set the conditions for spending it. To find that information, we have to look up the reference UTXO by retrieving the parent transaction that contains it. Notice that because of the value of inputs not explicitly stated, we also have to use the reference UTXO to calculate the transaction fees that will be paid in the transaction. Now, it's not just Alice's wallet that needs to retrieve the UTXO reference in the inputs. Once this transaction is broadcast to the network, every validating node is going to have to retrieve the UTXO reference in the transaction inputs in order to validate the transaction. Transactions on their own seem incomplete because they lack context. They reference UTXO in their inputs, but without retrieving that UTXO, we cannot know the value of the inputs or their locking conditions. So if you're writing your own Bitcoin software, anytime you decode a transaction with the intent of validating it or counting the transaction fees or checking the unlocking script, your code will first have to retrieve the reference UTXO from the blockchain in order to build the context implied but not present in the UTXO references of the inputs. For example, to calculate the amount paid in transaction fees, you must know the sum of the values in the inputs and the outputs. But without retrieving the UTXO reference in the inputs, you don't know the value of the inputs. So a seemingly simple operation like counting fees in a transaction involves multiple steps and data from multiple transactions. Um, and you can use commands like Bitcoin Core to uh, the to go ahead and retrieve the, uh, the transaction information uh, using the UTXO reference. So for example, um, we, would use, we could look up the previous transaction here, as you see at the bottom of the screen, uh, uh, looking up the previous transaction, it turns out um, Alice's previous transaction, she received uh, 0.1 Bitcoin, and here is the script pub key that locked that pub one, that, uh, 0.1 Bitcoin for which Alice's script sig is hopefully unlocking that transaction. When transactions are serialized for transmission on the network, their inputs are encoded as a, in a byte stream as shown here. There's a transaction hash, which is a, which is a pointer to the transaction containing the UTXO to be spent. There's the output index, which is the index number of the UTXO to be spent, uh, counting with the first one being zero. There's an unlocking script size, specifying what the size is. There's an unlocking script, which is a script that fulfills the conditions of the UTXO locking script. And is it a sequence number, which we'll talk about later. So script sig is a specific type of unlocking script that when serialized for transmission on the network, the inputs are encoded into a byte stream as shown on this table here. The serialization of the signature field, um, the signature hash, and so on are described below. So we've got our signature size, which is length in bytes. 
followed by a signature that is produced by the user's wallet from his or her private key, which includes a SIG hash. Then there's a public key size, and then there's a public key that's unhashed. Let's talk about the transaction fees. Most transactions include trans Bitcoin transaction fees, which compensate the Bitcoin miners for securing the network. Fees also serve as a security mechanism by making it you know, economically infeasible for attackers to do a denial service attack by flooding, flooding the network with low value transactions. Mining the fees and rewarded collected by miners is discussed in more detail in the lecture on mining. But let's talk a bit about how transaction fees are included in a typical transaction. Most wallets calculate and include transaction fees automatically. However, if you're writing your own software to perform Bitcoin transactions or you're using a command line interface, you should manually account for and include transaction fees. Transaction fees serve as an incentive to include uh, for miners to include a transaction in the next block and also as a disincentive against abuse of the system by imposing a small cost on every transaction. Transaction fees are collected by the miner who mines the block that records the transaction on the blockchain. So that miner actually gets paid twice for creating the block, once for creating the, the block reward and secondly with all the transaction fees. Transaction fees are calculated based on the size of the transaction in kilobytes, not the value of the transactions in Bitcoin, which means you can have a very large transaction with not much in the way of transaction fees. Overall, transaction fees are set by market forces within the Bitcoin network. Miners prioritize transactions based on many different criteria, including fees. It might even process transactions for free under certain circumstances. Transaction fees affect the processing priority, meaning that a transaction with sufficient fees is likely to be included in the next block mined, or the transaction with insufficient or no fees might be delayed, processed on a best effort, best basis after a few blocks, or not processed at all. Transaction fees are not mandatory, and transactions without fees might be processed eventually. However, including transaction fees encourages priority processing. Over time, the way transaction fees are calculated and the effect they have on transaction prioritization has evolved. At first, in the early days of the Bitcoin network, transaction fees were fixed and constant across the network. Gradually, the fee structure relaxed and was influenced by market forces based on network capacity and transaction volume. Uh, since at least uh, 2016, capacity limits in Bitcoin have created competition between transactions resulted in higher fees and effectively making free transactions a thing of the past. Zero fee or very low fee transactions rarely get mined and sometimes will not even be sent across the network. In Bitcoin Core, fee relay policies are set by the mining minimum relay transaction fee option. Uh, the current default minimum relay transaction fee is 0 0.00001 Bitcoin or a hundredth of a mill of Bitcoin per kil kilobyte. So transactions with a fee less than 0 0.00001 Bitcoin are treated as free and are only relayed if there's space in the mempool. Otherwise they are dropped. Uh, Bitcoin nodes can override the default v fee relay policy by adjusting the value of minimum relay transaction fee. Any Bitcoin service that creates transactions, including wallets, exchanges, retail applications, should implement dynamic fees. Dynamic fees can be implemented through a third-party fee estimation service or with a built-in fee estimation algorithm. If you're unsure, begin with a third-party service, and as you gain experience, design and implement your own algorithm if you wish to remove the dependency on a third party. Fee estimation algorithms calculate the appropriate fee, based on capacity and the fees offered by competing transactions. These algorithms range from simplistic, like an average or a median fee in the last block, to sophisticated based on statistical analysis. Um, they can estimate the necessary fee and satoshis per byte that would give a transaction a high probability of being selected and included within a certain number of blocks. Most services offer users the option of choosing high, medium, or low priority fees. High priority means the user paid higher fees, but the transaction is likely to be included in the next block. 
medium, and low priority means the user pays lower transaction fees, but the transactions may take longer to confirm. Many wallet applications use third-party services for fee calculations. Uh, one popular service is BitcoinFees.Earn.com, uh, which provides an API and a visual chart showing the fee and Satoshi Byte for different priorities. Um, static fees are no longer viable in the Bitcoin network. Wallets that set static fees will produce a poor user experience as transactions will often get stuck and remain unconfirmed. Users who don't understand Bitcoin transactions and fees can be disillusioned by stuck transactions because they think that the money has gotten lost. So here's a chart showing a real-time estimate of fees in 10 Satoshi byte increments and the expected confirmation time in minutes and number of blocks for transactions with fees in each range. Uh, for each fee range, for example, 61 to 70 Satoshi per byte, two horizontal bars show the number of unconfirmed transactions and the total number of transactions in the past 24 hours with fees in that range. Based on that graph, the recommended high priority fee at that time was 80 Satoshis per byte, um, which was likely to result in the transaction being mined in the next block. Uh, the median transaction size was 226 bytes, so the recommended fee for that transaction would be 18,000 Satoshis. Uh, the fee estimation data can be retrieved uh, via a REST API uh, from the BitcoinFeesEarn.com website. So the data structure of transactions does not have a feel for fees. Instead, transaction fees are implied as a difference between the sum of the inputs and the sum of the outputs. Any excess amount that remains after all outputs have been deducted from all inputs is a, is a fee that is collected by the miners. So, you know, as, as the formula shows here, the transaction fees equals the sum of the inputs minus the sum of the outputs. This is a somewhat confusing element of transactions, and it's an important point to understand. Because if you're writing your own software to construct your own transactions, you want to make sure you don't inadvertently include a very large fee by underspending the inputs. That means you must account for all inputs if necessary by creating change, or you will end up giving the miners a very big tip. Uh, some early Bitcoin applications made this mistake and made rather large payments to miners. So for example, if you consume a 20 Bitcoin UTXO to make a one Bitcoin payment, you must include a 19 Bitcoin change output back to your wallet. Otherwise, the 19 Bitcoin leftover will be counted as a transaction fee that will be collected by the miner who mines your transaction a block. Uh, although you'll receive priority processing uh, and you'll make a miner very happy, this is probably not what you intended. So let's see how this works in practice by looking at Alice's coffee purchase again. If Alice wants to spend 0 0.015 Bitcoin to pay for coffee, to ensure the transaction is processed promptly, she'll want to include a transaction fee, say 0 0.0005. This will mean that the total cost of the transaction will be 0 0.0155. Her wallet must therefore have a source set of UTXO that adds up to at least 0 0.0155 or more and if necessary, create change. So since her wallet has this 0.1 Bitcoin UTXO that she received from Joe, um, she'll need to consume that UTXO, create an output for Bob's Cafe at 0 0.015 and a second output, which is her change, a 0 0.0845 change leaving a difference between the sum of the inputs and the outputs, which is 0 0.0005, which becomes the implicit transaction fee for the transaction. So let's dive into, uh, so that's all about the amounts and transaction fees. Let's dive into those unlocking scripts and script sigs and talk about what's actually going on with transaction scripts and the Bitcoin script language. So the Bitcoin transaction script language called script is a fourth like reverse Polish notation stack based execution language. Um, you know, it's, it's based on some 1960s programming language technologies, uh, but basically the locking script placed on the UTXO and the unlocking script are both written in this Bitcoin script language. When a transaction is validated, the unlocking script in each input is executed alongside the corresponding locking script to see if it satisfies the spending condition. 
Bitcoin script is a really simple language. It's designed to be limited in scope and it's executable on a wide range of hardware. Something as simple as an embedded device can handle it. Bitcoin script requires minimal processing and can't do many of the fancy things that modern programming languages can do. For its use in validating programmable, mo programmable money, this is a deliberate security feature. Today, most transactions processed through the Bitcoin network have the form payment to someone's Bitcoin address and are based on a script that's called a pay to public key hash script. However, Bitcoin transactions are not limited to this pay to someone's Bitcoin address script. In fact, locking scripts can be written to express a vast variety of complicated conditions. In order to understand these more complicated scripts, we must first understand the basics of transaction scripts and script language. So we're gonna take a look at the basic components of the Bitcoin transaction scripting language and show how it can be used to express simple conditions for spending and how those conditions can be satisfied by unlocking scripts. Now, Bitcoin transaction validation is not based on a static pattern, but is instead is achieved through the execution of the scripting language. This language allows for a nearly infinite variety of conditions to be expressed. And this is how Bitcoin gets the power of programmable money. So one concept that we should know about Bitcoin is, is that it's not a, the Bitcoin script is not a general purpose language. And in fact, uh, sometimes the language is referred to as being Turing incomplete. Um, and that's because this programming language is deliberately limited in one important way. There are no loops or complex flow control capabilities other than conditional flow control. So there's no while loops or for loops. Um, there is the equivalent of if else, but that's about it. So this ensures that the language is not Turing complete, meaning that the scripts have limited complexity and, and more importantly, the scripts have predictable execution times. Uh, script is not a general purpose language. These limitations ensure that the language can't be used to create an infinite loop or some other form of logic bomb that could be embedded in a transaction in a way that causes a denial of service attack against the Bitcoin network. Remember, every transaction is being validated by every full node on the Bitcoin network, which means every transaction is being validated by tens of thousands of nodes. A limited language prevents the transaction validation mechanism from being used as a vulnerability. The Bitcoin transaction script language is stateless in that there are no, is no state prior to execution of the script and there's no state saved after execution of the script. Therefore, all the information needed to execute a script should be contained within the script. A script will predict, predictably execute the same way on any system. If your system verifies a script, you can be sure that every other system in the Bitcoin network will also verify the script, meaning that a valid transaction is valid for everyone and everyone knows that it's valid for everyone. This predictability of outcomes is an essential benefit of the Bitcoin system because it ensures that the blockchain can reach consensus. So let's talk about how this works with script construction and locking and unlocking. Bitcoin's transaction validation engine relies on two types of scripts to validate transactions, a locking script and an unlocking script. A locking script is going to place a spending condition on an output. The unlocking script will fulfill the spending condition put on the output and allow the output to be spent. Every Bitcoin validating node is going to validate the transactions by executing these locking and unlocking scripts together. A locking script is a spending condition placed on an output. It specifies the conditions that must be met to spend the output in the future. Historically, the locking script was called a script pub key because it usually contained a public key or a Bitcoin address, which is a hash of a public key. However, I'm gonna to refer to it as a locking script to acknowledge the much broader range of possibilities of the script of language. In most Bitcoin applications, what we refer to as a script locking script will appear in a source code as a script pub key. You might also see the locking script referred to as a witness script or as a cryptographic puzzle. These terms all mean the same thing at different levels of abstraction. 
An unlocking script is a script that solves or satisfies conditions placed on an output by a locking script and allows the output to be spent. Unlocking scripts are part of every transaction input. Most of the time, they contain a digital signature produced by the user's wallet and is their private key. Historically, the unlocking script was called script sig because it usually contained a digital signature. Uh, in most Bitcoin applications, the source code refers to the unlocking script as a script sig. You also see the unlocking script referred to as a witness. Um, referring to it as an unlocking script acknowledges the broader range of locking script requirements because not all locking, unlocking scripts have to have signatures. Every Bitcoin validating node, validating node is going to validate the transactions by executing the locking and the locking scripts together. Each input contains an unlocking script and refers to a previously existing UTXO. The validation software will copy the unlocking script, retrieve the UTXO referenced by the input, and copy the locking script from the UTXO. The locking, unlocking and locking scripts are then executed in sequence. The input is valid if the unlocking script satisfies the locking script conditions. All the inputs are validated independently as part of the overall validation of the transaction. The UTXO is permanently in recorded in the blockchain and therefore is invariable and is unaffected by failed attempts to spend it by reference to a new transaction. Only a valid transaction that correctly satisfies the conditions of the output results in the output being considered as spent and removed from the set of UTXOs. So here we see um, combining a script sig and a script pub key to evaluate a transaction script. Um, and this is the most common example of unlocking and locking scripts for a Bitcoin transaction, uh, which in this case is a payment to a public key hash, showing the combined script that results from the concatenation of the unlocking and locking scripts prior to script validation. So if you look at this, what do we have? We've got our unlocking script and we have our locking script, uh, we'll, we'll, which we'll refer to as a script sig and a script pub key. The script sig has a signature and a public key. Um, so that signature is your digital signature, uh, and this is your public key. Um, and so you put those are the requirements to unlock it. When you lock the Bitcoin, you we put this do hash one sixty public key hash equal verify check sig, and this public key hash is the address uh, that we're sending the Bitcoin to. And then the way we unlock it is to add in the public key and the digital signature for the person for the private key that's uh, associated with that address. So Bitcoin, I mentioned earlier that Bitcoin scripting language is a stack based language. So let's explain what a stack is. A stack is a very simple data structure that can be visualized as a stack of cards. Stack allows two operations. Uh, push and pop, uh, push adds an item on top of the stack, pop removes the top item from the stack. Uh, operations in the stack can only act on the topmost item on the stack. Stack data structures are also sometimes referred to as LIFOs or last in first outs. Think of this as like a stack of plates or a stack of cards. Um, you put an item on top of the stack of plates, you take the top plate off the stack of plates. That's the basic idea uh, behind a stack-based language or a stack-based uh, data structure. So Bitcoin scripting language is a stack-based language because it has a data structure called a stack. Uh, the scripting language executes the script by processing each item from left to right. Numbers, um, you know, data essentially are pushed onto the stack. Operators will push or pop one or more parameters from the stack, act on them, and might push a result onto the stack. For example, op add will pop two items from the stack, uh, two numbers from the stack, add those two numbers, and then push the resulting sum onto the stack. Conditional operators evaluate a condition, producing a Boolean result of true or false. For example, op equal pops two items to the stack and pushes true on the stack if those two numbers are equal, pushes false on the stack if those two numbers are not equal. Bitcoin transactions Transaction scripts usually contain a conditional operator so they can produce a true or false result uh, with true being a valid transaction and false being an invalid transaction. So here's a simple 
truth script example. Uh, we've got this script here, two, three, op add, five, op equal. This demonstrates the arithmetic addition operator op add, adding two numbers and putting the result of a stack, followed by the conditional operator um, op equal, which checks that the resulting sum is equal to five. Although most locking scripts refer to uh, a public key hash, thereby requiring proof of ownership to spend the funds, scripts don't have to be that complicated. Any combination of locking and unlocking scripts will result in a true value is valid. The simple arithmetic we used here as an example of scripting language could be a valid locking script on the blockchain. So for example, uh, imagine someone had put three op add five op equal on the blockchain. Well, then if that's your locking script, your unlocking script would be anything that you, any number you could put in front of it that would then make it true. So in this case, our unlocking script could be two because this would result in two, three, op add, five, op equal. Um, and when you executed that, the result would be op true, making the transaction valid and allowing you to spend the Bitcoin that was locked by the script three, op add, five, op equal. So here's an example of how this would actually work. So transactions are going to be valid if the top result of the stack is true after the uh, script execution. And it's going to be invalid if the top value is false or script execution was halted by uh, some terminator. So let's suppose when we combine our lock unlocking script and our locking script, we have this two, three, add five equals. So what is actually happening? Well, the first thing that happens is we take the very first number, uh, numbers are gonna go on the stack and operators will do something. So we take a number and we just put it on the stack, it's two. So now we got two on the stack. The next thing in the script is a three. So now we put three on the stack. Next up is an add. So we're gonna pop two and three, off, which are the top two numbers in the stack, we'll pop them off. We'll add them, our sum is five, and now we'll put sum on the stack. We'll put the sum of five on the stack. Next up, we have another five. So now we got two fives on the stack. And then our last command is equal. So now we're gonna look at our two fives and if they're equal, we'll put true on the stack. If they were not equal, we'd put false on the stack. Um, note that many of the commands and uh, items in the script language have an OP underscore prefix. Uh, which I dropped from this uh, diagram to make it easier to read. Um, and you could do many other uh, possible uh, examples. You know, you, you know, I, I gave a very simple one using addition and equals as comparison. But there's a lot of different things you can do. You can. Uh, there's many, many different commands. There's almost 200 commands in uh, Bitcoin script, and we'll take a look at those later. Um, now, you could actually validate these scripts in paper and pencil. You could also make some really complicated scripts that are much harder to uh, handle. In the original Bitcoin client, the unlocking and locking scripts were concatenated and executed in sequence. Uh, for security reasons, that was changed later because of vulnerability that allowed a uh, malformed unlocking script to push data on the stack and corrupt the locking script. In the current implementation, the scripts are executed separately with the stack transferred between the two executions. First, the unlocking script is executed using the script stack execution engine. If the unlocking script is executed without errors, then the main stack is copied and the locking script is then executed. If the result of executing the locking script with the stack copied from the script, unlocking script is true, uh, the unlocking script is succeeding in resolving the conditions imposed by a locking script, and therefore the input is a valid authorization to spend the UTXOs. If any result other than true remains after execution of the combined script, input is invalid because it has failed to satisfy the spending conditions placed on the UTXO. Now let's talk about pay to public key hash. So the vast majority of transactions processed in the Bitcoin network spend outputs locked with a pay to public key hash or P2PKH script. These outputs contain a locking script that locks the output to a public key hash, uh, which you know 
is another word for a Bitcoin address. An output locate locked by a public key hash can be unlocked by presenting a public key in a digital signature created by the corresponding private key. So for example, let's look at Alice's payment to Bob's Cafe again. Alice made a payment of 0.015 Bitcoins to the cafe's Bitcoin address. That transaction output would have a locking script of the form we have here. Op dupe, op hash 160, public key hash, op equal verify, op, ch op check sig. So that public key hash there, if, we're, if this is a payment from Alice to Bob, would have the locking script of a payment to Bob's Cafe. So it'd be Bob's uh, Cafe in the public key hash. So when Bob wants to spend the pay money he received from Alice, he needs to sign it with his signature and public key so that he can then spend the money somewhere else. So satisfying unlocking script for this pay to public key hash is just a signature and a public key. And so when you combine it, you start off with a signature and a public key, followed by an op dupe, an op hash 160, then a public key hash, and an op equal verify, and op check, op check sig. So the cafe's public key hash is equivalent to the Bitcoin address of the cafe without the base 58 check encoding. Most applications would show the public key hash in hexadecimal and not in the familiar Bitcoin address base 58 check format begins with a one. Um, and as I said, the preceding locking script can be satisfied with an unlocking script, which is just your signature and public key. So when executed, this combined script is gonna evaluate the true if and only if the unlocking script matches the conditions set by the locking script. In other words, the result will be true if the unlocking script has a valid signature from the cafe's private key that corresponds to the public key hash that was set in the locking script. So here is stepping through how we would take this uh, script sig and script pub key and put them on the stack uh, and execute them uh, through the Bitcoin scripting language execution engine. So we start off with, we've got our signature and the signature, the public key and the public key hash are all numeric values. Um, so they're data values. And so we'll just put, and those three will just get popped up onto the stack like any number would. So we put the signature on the stack. Uh, next, we come to the public key, we put that on the stack. The next command is dupe. And by the way, similar to the last time we did this, we dropped off all the OPs. So this would still be OP underscore dupe, OP underscore hash 160, OP underscore equal verify, and OP underscore check sig. So we have dupe. What dupe does is it duplicates the top item in the stack and then pushes that on the top of the stack. So we had sig and pub key on the stack. Pub key was the top item in the stack. So that gets duplicated and it gets pushed to stacks. So now we have two public keys on the stack. The next command is hash 160. Hash 160 will take the top item in the stack and it will hash it with, uh, similar to what we're doing when we convert a, a public key to an address. We'll hash it with SHA-26 followed by RIPEMD160, uh, sometimes referred to as a double hash. So we do this double hash on it and the resulting value pub key hash is pushed to the top of the stack. So now we got this public key hash on the top of the stack as well as our public key and our sig. Now in our script, our next item is public key hash. It's what we would lock the script with. So we take that public key hash that we lock the script with and it's a value here and we just put it up on the stack. Now we get to equal verify. The equal verify operators can compare the two top items on the stack. Uh, basically comparing the public key hash that was in the locking script with the public key hash we just computed from the user's public key. If they match, both are removed and execution continues. So in this particular case, we'll assume that, uh, you know, Bob did enter in the correct uh, private key that supports his, uh, and his public key that supports his uh, private key. And now both public key hashes were equal and we have true. So now we just have pub key and sig on the stack and we just have the check sig. The check sig operator checks that the signature matches the public key and pushes true to the top of the stack of true. 
So if this public key and the signature matched each other, we'll have a true result and we have validated uh, the Bitcoin transaction. It's valid and those coins should be spent uh, because uh, Bob is the correct owner of the Bitcoin uh, and he owns, he proved he owned the private key. So let's talk a little bit more about digital signatures. Since we're creating this digital signature, that is part of our scripting. So the digital signature algorithm used in Bitcoin is the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm or ECDSA, uh, you know, based on the elliptic curve cryptography. ECDSA is an algorithm used for digital signatures based on the elliptic curve private public key pairs. Uh, it's used by the script functions, op check sig, op check sig verify, and other related uh, operations that check the signature. Anytime you see a, a command like that in a locking script, the unlocking script must contain an ECDSA signature. A digital signature it serves three purposes in Bitcoin. First, the signature proves that the owner of the private key, uh, who is by implication the owner of the funds, has authorized the spending of those funds. Secondly, the proof of authorization is undeniable. Uh, that is a you know, non-repudiation. You, know, you can't deny that he was spending it. Thirdly, the signature proves that the transaction or specific parts of the transaction have not and cannot be modified by anyone after it's been signed. Note that each transaction input can be signed independently. This is critical as neither the signatures nor the inputs have to belong to or be apply, uh, applied by the same owners. In fact, a specific transaction scheme called CoinJoin uses this fact to create multi-party transactions for privacy. Uh, each transaction input and any signature it may contain can be completely independent of any other input or signature. Multiple parties can collaborate to construct transactions and sign only one input each. Uh, Wikipedia defines a digital signature as a mathematical scheme for demonstrating the authenticity of a digital message or documents. A valid digital signature gives the recipient a reason to believe that the message was created by a known sender, authentication, and that the sender cannot deny having sent the message non-repudiation, and that the message was not altered in transit, which is integrity. So how digital signatures work? Uh, digital signature is a mathematical scheme that consists of multiple parts. The first part is an algorithm for creating a digital signature using a private key, which is our signing key, from a message, which is, in, this, in Bitcoin's case is a transaction. The second part is an algorithm that allows anyone to verify the signature, uh, assuming they have the message in the public key. So how do you create a digital signature? And Bitcoin's implementation of the elliptic curve digital signature al algorithm, the message being signed is a transaction, or more accurately, a hash of a subset of the data in the transaction. The signing key is a user's private key. The result is a signature. If you see this formula here, where signature equals F of sig, uh, up in parentheses, F hash of M, comma DA where DA is the signing private key, M is the transaction or parts of it, F hash is the hashing function, F sig is a signing algorithm, and sig is the resulting digital signature. The function F sig is gonna produce a signature sig that's composed of two values commonly referred to as R and S. Uh, once those two values R and S have been calculated, they'll be serialized into a byte stream um, and encoded. So let's look at the uh, transaction that we can create using a serialized byte stream of R and S values. Uh, these R and S values here are actually the digital signature from Alice's wallet when she is sending money to Bob. The serialized format has several elements included in it, and all this is hex values of you know zero to nine, A through F. So the first number 30 here that we see here for the first two digits indicates the start of the sequence. Then the next two numbers, 45, indicate the length of the sequence, um, which is 69 bytes because 45 in hexadecimal is 69. 
Uh, zero two is an integer value. 21 is the length of the integer value. Uh, and then R is this integer value, which is 33 bytes. So that's your R value. Then we have zero two for another integer coming up, which is gonna be the S value. 20 specifies the length of the S value, which in this case is only 32 bytes. Um, then we have the value for S, the 4B9, et cetera. Then that's followed by 01, which is a suffix indicating the type of hash that was used. In this case, it was a SIG hash. So this is our serialized byte stream of the R and S values that represent the digital signature. So to verify the signature, uh, one must have the signature, i.e. the RNS values, the serialized transaction, because you, you know, the signature goes along with the transaction, so you need to have the transaction to, to verify the signature, and the public key, because you, know, you don't have the private key, you have the signature, and then you have the public key, and the two of them together along with the transaction allows you to verify that this didn't come this did in fact come from the private key, even though you don't know what the private key value is. So essentially verification of a signature means only the owner of the private key that generated this public key could have produced this signature in this transaction. The signature verification algorithm takes the message, you know, hash of the transaction and parts of it, the signer's public key and the signature RNS values and it returns true if the signature is valid for this message and public key. So let's talk about signature hash types or SIG hash. Digital signatures are applied to messages, which in the case of Bitcoin is the transactions themselves. The signature implies a commitment by the signer to specific transaction data. In the simplest form, the signature applies to the entire transaction, thereby committing all the inputs, outputs, and other transaction fields. However, a signature can commit to only a subset of the data in a transaction, which is useful for a number of different scenarios. Bitcoin signatures have a way of indicating which part of a transaction's data is included in the hash signed by a private key using a SIG hash flag. The SIG hash flag is a single byte that's dependent on the signature. Every signature has a SIG hash flag, and the flag can be different from input to input. A transaction with three signed inputs may have three signatures with different SIG hash flags, each signature signing different parts of the transaction. Uh, each input may contain a signature in its unlocking script. As a result, a transaction that contains several inputs may have signatures with different SIG hash flags that commit different parts of the transaction to each of the inputs. Also, Bitcoin transactions may contain inputs from different owners who, who may sign only one input in a partially constructed transaction, collaborating with others to gather all the necessary signatures to make the transaction valid. Many of the SIG hash flag types only make sense if you think of multiple participants collaborating outside the Bitcoin network and updating a partially signed transaction. There are three SIG hash flags, um, all none and single shown in this table. So the all SIG hash flag says the signature applies to all the inputs and outputs. So that's your basic flag you would use if there's only one person gonna be signing this transaction. The none flag says the signature applies to all the inputs but none of the outputs. And the single says signature applies to all the inputs but only the one output with the same index numbers assigned input. In addition, there's a modifier uh, flag, which is SIG hash anyone can pay, which can be combined with each of those three we just looked at, the L, the none, and the single. When anyone can pay is set, only one input is signed, leaving the rest and the sequence number open for modification. The anyone can pay is a vet. Uh, so here, for example, we've got all none and single, and now we've attached anyone can pay flags. So for all anyone can pay, the signature applies to one input and all the outputs. For none anyone can pay, signature applies to one input, but none of the outputs. And single anyone can pay, uh, signature applies to one input and one output. 
So using these different combinations together, then you can start constructing transactions where you have multiple people signing transactions, as we can see in the next diagram here. So here's our summary of our different SIG hash combinations. Um, all, you know, everything's going to be signed, the inputs and the outputs. None, you're signing the inputs, but none of the outputs. Single, you're signing all the inputs and one of the outputs. And then once we start adding these, anyone can pays. For all, anyone can pay, you sign the first input and all the outputs. None, anyone can pay, you sign one input and none of the outputs. And single, you sign one input and one output. The way SIG hash flags are applied during signing and verification is that a copy of the transaction is made and certain fields within are truncated. The resulting transactions are serialized. The SIG hash flag is added to the end of the serialized transaction and the result is hashed. The hash itself is a message that is signed. Depending on which SIG hash flag is used, different parts of the transaction are truncated. The resulting hash depends on different subsets of the data in the transaction. Uh, by including the SIG hash as a last step before hashing, the signature commits the SIG hash type as well, so that it can't be changed uh, by a miner who's trying to hack the transaction. So let's look at some of these different SIG hash types and how they can be used in practice. All anyone can pay. Uh, this construction can be used to make a crowdfunding style transaction. Someone attempting to raise funds, can construct a transaction with a single output. The single output pays the goal amount to the fundraiser. Such a transaction is not valid, as it has, doesn't have any inputs. However, others can now amend the transaction by adding an input of their own as a donation. They sign their own input with all anyone can pay. Unless enough inputs are gathered to reach the value of the output, the transaction is invalid. Each donation is essentially a pledge which can't, which can't be collected by the fundraiser until the entire goal amount is raised. Um, none. This construction can be used to create a bearer check or a blank check of a specific amount. It commits the input, but allows the output locking script to be changed. Anyone can write their own Bitcoin address in the output locking script and redeem the transaction. However, the output value itself is locked by the signature. None. Anyone can pay. This can be used to build a dust collector. Users who have tiny UTXOs in their wallets who can't spend these because the cost and fees exceeds the value of the dust. With this type of signature, the dust UTXO can be donated for anyone to aggregate and spend wherever they want. There are some proposals to modify or expand the SIG hash system. Um, you will not see SIG hash flags uh, presented as an option in a user's wallet. With few exceptions, wallets generally construct P2 PKH scripts and sign with the SIG hash all flags. To use a different SIG hash flag, you'd have to write your own Bitcoin software to construct and sign your transactions. Um, more importantly, SIG hash flags can be used by special purpose Bitcoin applications that can do things that uh, are different from what most wallets will do. Let's talk a little bit more about digital signatures and how the elliptic curve digital signing algorithm works. So as I mentioned before, uh, Bitcoin digital signatures are created by a mathematical function, F-sig, that produces a signature composed of two values, R and S. So let's dive into some more of the details. The signature algorithm first generates a temporary or ephemeral pro public-private key pair. This temporary key pair is used in the calculation of the R and S values after a transformation involving the signing private key in the transaction hash. This temporary key pair is based on a random number K, which is used as a temporary private key. From K, we generate the corresponding temporary public key P, which is calculated using the uh, ECC algorithm. So it's K times our generator equals P, the same way Bitcoin public keys are derived. The R value of the digital signature is the X coordinate of our public key P. And from there, the algorithm calculates S value of the signature such that S equals um, K inverse uh, times uh, hash of M plus the digital algorithm times R all passed into uh, mod N. 
uh, n being the prime order of the elliptic curve. Uh, verification, uh, so that produces your signature. Verification is the inverse of the signature generation function using the RS values in the public key to calculate a va of value P, which is a point on the elliptic curve. So here's our signature algorithms, S equals K inverse hash N plus digital algorithm times R mod N. And now we're gonna do the inverse to compute, uh, to, to verify this digital signature. So our inverse uh, formula here is P, uh, the public key P equals S inverse times hash M times the generator point plus S inverse times R times QA, where QA is Alice's public key. If the X coordinate of the calculated point P is equal to R, then the verifier can conclude that the signature is valid. Now, in verifying the signature, um, you don't need to know the private key to verify the signature and the, the private key is not exposed. Um, ECESA is a somewhat complicated piece of mathematics. Uh, a full explanation uh, is really something you should look at in a course on cryptography. Um, there are some great courses on cryptography out there on the internet. I highly recommend the Coursera course by Dan Bonet on cryptography. Um, as we saw in ECDSA, uh, the signature generation algorithm uses a random key K, uh, K as a basis for a temporary private public key pair. The value of the private key is not important so long as it's random. If the same value K is used to produce two different signatures on different messages, uh, i.e. Bitcoin transactions, then the signing private key could be calculated. Reuse of the same value for K in a signature algorithm leads to the exposure of the private key. Uh, this is not just a theoretical possibility. Uh, we've seen this issue lead to exposure of private keys in different implementations of transaction signing algorithms in Bitcoin. People have had their Bitcoin funds stolen because of an inadvertent reuse of a K value. The most common re reason for reuse of a K value would be an improperly initialized random number generator. To avoid this vulnerability, the industry best practice is not to not generate K for random number generators C2 of entropy, but instead to use a deterministic random process seed with the transaction data itself. That would ensure that each transaction produces a different K. Uh, the industry standard algorithm for deterministic initialization of K uh, is defined in a standard from the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force. Uh, if you're implementing an algorithm to sign transactions in Bitcoin, you should use the standard or a similarly deterministic random algorithm to ensure you generate a different K for each transaction. So we started off this lecture by diving into uh, how transactions look very different behind the scenes than how they're presented in the user interface in wallets and blockchain explorers and other user facing Bitcoin applications. Many of the simplistic and familiar concepts such as Bitcoin addresses and balances aren't really even mentioned in the transaction structure. We saw that transactions don't contain Bitcoin addresses per se, but instead operate through scripts that lock and unlock discrete values of Bitcoin. Balances aren't present anywhere in the system, and yet every wallet application prominently displays the balance of the user's wallet. Now that we've explored what is actually included in a Bitcoin transaction, we can take a look at how the higher level abstractions are derived the seemingly primitive components of the transaction. So here again, we have our transaction details screen uh, for Alice's transaction to buy a cup of coffee. On the left side of the transaction, the blockchain explorer shows Alice's Bitcoin address as the sender. In fact, this information is not in the transaction. When the blockchain explorer references the transaction, it also references the previous transaction associated with the input and extracts the first output from that older transaction. Within that output is a locking script that locks the UTXO to Alice's public key hash, which is a P2PKH script. The blockchain explorer extracted the public key hash and encoded it using base 58 check encoding to produce and display the public key address, the Bitcoin address that represents the public key. Similarly, on the right side, the blockchain explorer shows the two outputs. The first, the Bob's Bitcoin address, 
And the second to Alice's Bitcoin addresses change. Once again, to create these Bitcoin addresses, the Blockchain Explorer extracted the locking script from each output, recognized it as a P2PKH script, and extracted the public key hash from within. Finally, the Blockchain Explorer encoded each public key hash with base 58 check so that it would display Bitcoin addresses as opposed to the public key hashes. If you were to click on Bob's Bitcoin address, um, you might see uh, Bob's uh, balance here where he's got his address, his hash 160, some tools, and some transactions. So the Blockchain Explorer displays the balance of Bob's uh, Bitcoin address, but nowhere in the Bitcoin system is there a constant of balance. Rather, the values displayed here are constructed by the Blockchain Explorer as follows. To construct the total received amount, the Blockchain Explorer first will decode the base 58 check encoding of the Bitcoin address to retrieve the 160-bit hash of Bob's public key is encoded within the address. Then the Blockchain Explorer will search through the database of transactions looking for outputs with P2PKH locking scripts that contain Bob's public key hash. By summing up the value of all the outputs, the Blockchain Explorer can produce the total value received. Constructing the current balance, which is described as the final balance requires a bit more work. The Blockchain Explorer keeps a separate database of the outputs that are previously uh, on spent, the UTXO set. To maintain this database, the Blockchain Explorer must monitor the Bitcoin network, add newly created UTXOs, and remove spent UTXOs as they appear in transactions. This is a complicated process. It depends on keeping track of transactions as they propagate, uh, as well as maintaining consensus with the Bitcoin network to ensure that the correct chain is followed. Sometimes the Blockchain Explorer goes out of sync and its perspective of the UTXO set is incomplete or incorrect. So sometimes in order to produce this image, uh, you know, the wallet has to go, or the wall explorer has to go through a large number of UTXOs, uh, possibly hundreds of UTXOs that, you know, to add them all up and then come up with what the balance is. But for, by presenting the simplistic view of Bitcoin transactions that resembles, resembles bank checks from one center to an, another, these applications have to abstract a lot of underlying details. Um, and most wallet applications focus on common transactions like P2PKH transactions with SIG hash all signatures. Um, and while these applications can handle more than 80% of transactions, which are in this manner, you, more specialized transactions that don't follow that pattern can be very difficult for wallets and explorers to handle. And every day, hundreds of transactions that don't contain P2PKH outputs are confirmed on the blockchain. So blockchain explorers often present those types of transactions with warning messages that indicate they can't decode the address. And now that doesn't mean they're necessarily strange transactions. It just means they're transactions that are more complicated than the average transaction. We'll take a look at how to deal with more complicated transactions in the next lecture. So um, this video and these slides are, lic and are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. Um, this slide deck includes content from the Mastering Bitcoin GitHub site by Andreas Antonopoulos at github.com Bitcoin book. Uh, I'd like to thank Andreas for making his content available under this license. Again, this was the uh, lecture on Bitcoin transactions, part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Uh, thanks for watching it and let me know what you thought about this lecture.